Greetings and salutations. How the devil art thou? I'm Lucifer Storm, and I want to welcome you to Two Evil Scoundrels. And joining me, as always, is my co-host, Nick the Hatchet Henry. Nick, how the devil art thou, good sir? I'm good, mate. How are you this week? I am awake, and <laughs> I'm dressed. So two out of three, not too bad, mate. I'm still yeah. trying to figure out what number three is. Some people have said you're breathing, and I was like, mm, I don't know if that's really as important as being awake and dressed. Yeah, well, if it's good enough for me, life, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, uh, I just want to start off by saying uh, so many of you enjoyed our inaugural episode, and that was really good to hear. We've been seeing people sharing it. And Nick, you, you don't know this yet. I thought I'd save it for this moment. But the first episode is up on Spotify. Right. And, right. Now, I did not expect many people to check it out, you know, because it's only just gone up there. It's only been like the past few days or so. Well, we have had one listen, and the person who listened to it became our very first Spotify subscriber, follower, whatever they call it. So I just want to say specifically to that person, I love you. I'm not in love with you, but I do love you. Thank you so much for checking out the show and being our first Spotify subscriber. You are officially awesome. If anyone tells you differently, come send them our way and we will put them in their place. We will correct them on the matter. <laughs> so that that's absolutely wonderful. What a Brilliant. great way. What a great I, way uh, to start things with this show. Mate, I've got so, a great place for radio. <laughs> Oh, I know you have, darling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, last time we talked about conventions, surviving conventions, especially as an indie comic book creator and stuff. This time, we're going to be talking about idea generation. Where do ideas come from? How do you get your ideas and stuff like that? Now, I don't know about you, Nick, but I get questions about this a hell of a lot. But it's not actually the easiest subject to talk about. Do you agree with that or, or is it different for you? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it is. It depends on what sort of questions are asked. Some people ask yeah. a question as though they, they want you to create an idea for them. Yes. Um, which is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I, I, I often find the, the, the main, I got, there's two main questions that I normally get asked about it. And one of them will probably come to uh, in a little bit, but the main one that I normally get is if you're stuck for ideas, I can give you one. Here it is. What do you think? Both. And like, that's to me, that is probably the trickiest question ever because I'm a full-time writer. It, it's, it's my job to have a play date with my imagination on a daily basis. I'm not short of ideas. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 And and people who are creative, they, they just pop in there at any weird time. You yeah. can't you can't schedule it. <laughs> yeah. They just yeah, pop but, you, yeah. I mean you, you can try to. Uh there are ways of scheduling it, but it's that whole thing like I, I I've heard other people talk about ideas before and one common thing that I, that I often hear people say is oh i'm an idea machine I, I just churn out ideas and i'm like yeah but which ones are good and which ones aren't because yeah. that's something yeah. i i do i do see people struggle with i see a lot i see a lot of people who go i've got 50 ideas and it's like yeah but how many of them are good because i mean at the end of the day i could have the idea to have a sandwich and that's a great idea if i'm especially if i'm hungry it's a great idea I could yeah. also have the idea of, I think I'll go shoot up at school. Not a good idea. Yeah. Not a good idea whatsoever. Yeah. Just, just because yeah. you have an idea doesn't mean that you should roll <laughs> with it, you know? So I think that's part of the reason why it is a difficult subject to talk about. Because deciphering whether you've got a good idea or not can be very subjective and personal. Definitely. Um, I think... See, I, I think that any idea, taking away all the shooting up and stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I, I, I just want to start off harsh because it's only yeah, going to get yeah, worse from here. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Trucks don't work. Um, yeah, no, I think that any idea creatively is worth noting. 
because yes, no matter how good or bad, and if we take the bad ones, uh, you can you can go back to those in the future. You could think, oh, I've had a better idea that involves yeah. that idea that I can make it better. Yeah, if yeah. that makes sense. Or yeah, so, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's all everything is worth noting uh, because you yeah. know can use it or not. And you might come, if you, if you get forward in a career and you, you start writing lots and lots of different things in different sort of genres, then you you, you might think that that'll fit that perfectly. So, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't discount them all. <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely not. But know which ones are the best to work with. No, yeah. like learning how to decipher which are the better ideas to roll with. And like I said, that's not necessarily an easy thing. I mean, I've had ideas before that I've, that I've, uh, you know, I've turned around to a trusted friend and said, you know, I've got this idea for a story and I've explained it to them. They've been like, dude, that sucks ass. Yeah. No one would ever want to read that. And then I'm like, you know what? My gut says differently. My gut says people are going to like this. And then I'll put that idea onto paper and then I'll turn it into a book. And then lo and behold, people really fucking like it. <laughs> you know? And yeah, and there's time, and there's times where you have an idea for a story, and you think you, you think yourself, that sucks. That's not going to be any good. Oh. And then you do it anyway, and people really like it. So, it, like I said, it's such a difficult, difficult thing to to get a handle on. It does take some time to perfect deciphering whether the ideas you've had are worth following or not. And sometimes it really is a crapshoot. Yeah, and you. Uh, the best way I find to do it is is you've got to have five people that you trust. Yeah. And, and just limit it. Don't go too mad. If you get an idea and you want to turn that into a comic or a graphic novel, um, yeah. get the five people you trust. Write down a very short synopsis of, of what it is, a yeah. story or a character, or, you know, and um, and show these five people. And yeah. I guarantee you'll get different views from every single one of them. Two of them may be similar, but you will get different views and they'll like certain aspects of it yeah. more than others. If they turn yeah. around and say, that is a proper stinker, I don't get it. And over half of them do that, say three of them, that then you know yeah. really, you think it's a good idea, but it might be a shit and put it to the yeah. side. Yeah, I don't waste time on, on, on things like that. It's if yeah. you if you get an idea and you think it's the best idea in the world and you go ahead and do it on your own, it's a tricky situation you're in because everyone uh, yeah. you know, it's just so different. Yeah, it it is tricky. I mean, when when I started out in my career, oh god knows how many years ago now, like well over 10 years ago. Yeah, you're an old timer, aren't you? You're like, you know. Oh, oh, I am. I am now. I uh, but... handle pace, do I have I've got to But when I started out, I found that I was surrounded by so many people that were just so desperate to tell me that every idea I had was bad that I didn't surround myself with anyone who I felt I could actually say my ideas to. So I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, there is I, that. I, I, I kept them to myself because I was like, you know what? If you want to find someone who is going to discourage your idea, all you have to do is open your front door, throw a rock, and you will hit someone. That's well, the unfortunate truth of it. You will find so many people out there who are just so quick to put your idea down because, unfortunately, there are some people out there with that crab mentality, the crab in the bucket who's like, oh, no, 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 you're not allowed to get anywhere. <laughs> you're not allowed anything yeah, like this. Absolutely. Let me pull you back down. And that's a real shame because I remember doing this charity event. This must have been 2012, 2013, maybe even a little earlier than that, maybe 2011. But anyway, I was doing this uh, this charity event and it was it was all based around creativity and stuff. And, it, you know, it's to help out the homeless and everything. And so they had people like myself there. They had stand-up comedians there. They had uh, rappers and, and musicians and, and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, they, they selected different people from all these different creative arts to go up and, like, give a little talk and stuff. And you, you were allowed to talk about anything as long as it was to do with creativity. 
And I had no idea what the fuck I was going to say. But I, I got up there and I was like, ah, actually, I've got an idea. So I took a £10 note out of my pocket and I just said, right, anyone who's in the audience who, you know, isn't a guest here or perform here or whatever, if you do anything that's creative, whether it be dancing, stand up, painting, whatever it is, put your hand up. And this person put their hand up and I said, right, come to the front of the stage, you. And this guy came to the front of the stage and I said, can you tell everyone what I've got in my hand? And he said, well, it's a £10 note. And I said, right. And I folded it up and I put it into the palm of my hand and closed my hand. And I said, where's the £10 note, right? And he said, it's in, it's in your hand. And I was like, good. So you know that there is £10 in my hand. He said, yes. I said, right, I want to tell you something. I don't know you. I don't know what you do creatively, but keep fucking doing it. Don't let anyone stop you. Don't let anyone put you down. You are amazing. Even if you don't think so, keep going. Because even if you're not amazing yet, you're going to be amazing. And no one can do what you do like you do. So keep doing it. Now, how much money do I have in my hand? And he said, you got £10. I said, yeah, because it costs nothing to encourage an artist. Oh. Nothing. Yeah. But it will cost you everything to discourage an artist. Because, like, I don't know if I've ever told you this story before. I know I've told it on a couple of different shows. When I started out my career, I was doing a book called Jericho. And that was inspired by my dad's battle with cancer. And it, I'm going to oversimplify what the story was about, but basically you had this this uh, superhero-ish character who was trying to find an alternative to chemotherapy. And, the, you know, the basic idea was what if there was a, a superhero whose villain was always three steps ahead of them, but it wasn't a person, it was a terminal disease. Yeah. Right? And that... That book started off really well. If it wasn't for that book, I wouldn't be where I am now. Oh. And I didn't realize how much of an impact that book had until I got a message from someone in America who th they emailed me and said, look, you know, I, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. I was really down, told I didn't have long left to live. I was thinking about ending it all because I didn't want to go through the chemotherapy and stuff. But then I picked up the first issue of your book, I read it, and it was great seeing a hero who was fighting for someone like me. Yeah. So that's given me the encouragement to keep going and to do the chemotherapy and stuff. And I was like, good for you, man. That's fucking awesome. Brilliant. I then didn't hear from that person for like a year, right? And I thought, shit, they're probably gone now. And then a couple of years after that, they messaged me saying, hey, sorry, I haven't been in touch. Wanted to let you know. I did the chemotherapy and all that. I had the operations. I'm all good and I'm still going. And it wouldn't have happened if they hadn't read my book. So imagine if someone had turned around to me and said, no, nah, don't do it. It's a shit idea. They yeah. may have been yeah. right, but then that guy wouldn't have had the encouragement to keep going. Yeah, it's inspirational, mate. You should be proud of that. Definitely. So, oh, but believe you me, I am. You've, you've hit on that. Which is another big talking point, which is if you're going to have an idea, you've got to make her original. Yes. Yes. And that is, it, that, that's one of those things that I think a lot of people think is more difficult than it actually is. Yeah. I, I, I find it, I do find it quite difficult sometimes when, when I write and I, I think I'll speak to, um, I mean, I'm lucky I've got my missus who's the biggest critic I've ever got. So yeah. she'll tell me if something's shit or not easily. And then I go like back burner that. <laughs> well, she, she's she's on the same wavelength, and I also talk to my illustrator Mike, who, who's the same, and he'll he'll say, "No, nah, I don't really, that don't really sit well." So I can back yeah. burner it. But um, originality, I find sometimes that because I come from a background of not so much comics with graphic novels of horror and horror films, yeah. Yeah. It, is when you when you're writing, and I. I always write horror, you know, it's my thing, so I'll stick, if the shit fits, wear it. So, yeah, I, I, I just find sometimes you, you write something down or you get an idea and you go, oh, yeah, this would be a good idea, blah, 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 and my missus would go, 
we watched a film of that a year ago. It's fucking hell. You know, and I, I think, oh yeah, that's true. So it is, it is such, it's, I find it quite hard to, to get those original stories there. And the more, it does about if you take aspects of like, how, say like you took a superhero and you took bits of 10 different superheroes and made them into one. And it was original. No one else had done it. That's fantastic. It doesn't matter if you do that because at the end of the yeah. day, there's loads of superheroes. If you're going to write a superhero story, you're stuck if it, it fucking it can't. Can't get a superhero <laughs> in there. But yeah, so, but yeah, I, I'd say it's just the originality of pieces. And I, I do see a lot, um, I'm critical of myself really badly. And, and yeah. if I do start writing something and, and it, it tweaks in there that it could be some something that's been done before, yeah. I'll go research it and see. And if it's bang on the button, then I'll just push it to the side and I go, no, I can't do it. Oh, yeah. Can't. Yeah. See, with originality, I I really don't worry about whether the idea is original when I come up with it. I worry about whether it speaks to me, you know. Uh, and I'm, I think that's mostly because I read a book a while ago by a guy called Austin Cleon called Steal Like an Artist. And it was him exploring the fact that Everything we we experience, whether it be in film, television, music, whatever, is all it, it, it's all taken something from somewhere else. And he came yeah. to this uh, th this idea because he was doing I think it was Instagram. He was doing it on. He made what he called a blackout poem, where he would take like a newspaper article, and he would take a black pen. And he would start crossing out words until there were literally only a handful left and they would make like a line from a poem. And he thought it was so original. And then someone messaged him and went, you do realize there was a guy who, who did this like 20 years ago. <laughs> and he, he, he thought, oh shit, it's not original. So he looked into that guy and then realized that guy had ripped someone else off 20 years before him. And that guy had ripped off someone 20 years before him. And that actually was like a, it went like hundreds of years back of people doing that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's when he started exploring it and going, you know what? There isn't actually really anything original anymore. Oh. You know, it, it's, it's someone else's take, but that's what does make it original. Because the, the whole reason why he called it steel like an artist is because if you borrow an idea then you're not going to change anything about it. You're not going to make it yours. You are literally... But it's like if I went round to your place and said, hey, can I borrow your T-shirt? If, if I borrow it from you, I've got to give it back in the exact same condition. So I can't do anything to it. But if I stole it from you, I can make it mine and go, well, I might cut the sleeves off or I might sew a patch onto it. Yeah. So that was kind of his point. Like, if you do notice that you, you know, you've taken something from somewhere else, make it your own, steal it, don't borrow it. Because if you borrow it, then yeah, everyone's going to see that it's plagiarism. But if you steal it and make it your own, it becomes your own thing, and people don't see it as unoriginal. They'll see it as being similar, but not the same. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of similarities in in a lot of characters in the comics as well. Yeah, uh, exactly what you're saying. Mm. I, mean, I, I can't yeah. tell the difference between Shazam and Superman, apart from Shazam's a kid. Yeah. But he <laughs> does the same sort of things. Um, yeah, and it's entirely fun to watch on the telly. I don't, I haven't never read any, but but mm. watching them on the TV, like the movies, and that, and they're both different in that way. But as far as superpowers going, they fly. They got strength. They, you yeah. know, it's all the same sort of thing. It's just changed it slightly so yeah, yeah where you're coming from there yeah absolutely it's all about putting your voice on it because that's you know your voice is your own no one else can truly mimic your voice you know uh when, when it comes to like your style of, of writing especially when you're exploring an idea but but the main thing is the main thing is that we should really be talking about that i think is techniques on coming up with ideas because th there's always going to be that point regardless of where you are in your career or, or if you create uh, comics as a hobby 
there's always going to be that point where you need to do something new, whether it be as, as a side project or for something that you can fully flesh out later on once you're finished with another book. You know there's always going to be that point where you need something new. So what are some of the techniques that you've tried uh, when it comes to idea generation? Because I think everyone has like different techniques when it comes to this sort of thing. Yeah. Do you know what? It's a bit tricky for me to answer that because when it comes to the, the generation of it, it just pops in there and I just never know when yeah. it's going to happen. Uh, I, I honestly can't say, and I, I'm, I'll, I'm, I presume that it's the same with a lot of people, that you could yeah. be walking down the road and, and something will just pop in there. If you're creative, you'll get yeah. an idea for a character or a story and you can build whatever around whatever. So yeah. if you've got your character, you build your story around it. If you've got your story, you can bring your characters into it. Um, I've, I've just had them at the weirdest times, the weirdest times. You know, I could wake up at night and, I've, and I have to wake my missus up and go, I've just had a cracking idea for a story. <laughs> and she goes, That's it. fuck up and go to sleep, will you? <laughs> That's it, yeah. I mean, it could happen just so I'd be sitting downstairs watching the telly with her and, and, and I'll go, oh, I've just had a cracking on. And I'll, it could be just totally out of blue. And, and, and it just comes. It's just the weirdest, it's the weirdest thing. I, I don't know if I'm a people. They must have, like yourself, like you've got, you've got the idea. You've seen something somewhere. Say, let's take Ed Gein. So, uh -huh. fascination with horror and the macabre. Same as me. Yeah. Yeah. So you've seen Ed Gein somewhere, and somewhere in your brain has gone, wouldn't it be great if I could bring him back from hell and he could hunt demons? Well, how? Why did you do that? <laughs> I, I just don't... The, the, it works well, in mysterious ways, you, you, you're knocking. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with Ed Gein Demon Hunter, what it was is... I, I have quite a few friends who are into serial killers and stuff. And when I was a teenager, I was very much interested in, in serial killers because, you know, I was that kid that just didn't fit in at school. Regardless of how I look now, going back about 25, 30 years, when, when I was a teenager at school, I was the long-haired kid in the sea of French crops. <laughs> okay, whenever whenever it was Mufti Day, you had the kids who turned up going, yeah, look at my, my cheap, tacky knockoff Yves Saint Laurent brightly coloured shirt or whatever and my jeans and stuff. Aren't I great? And I would turn up. Green Flash, the Adidas. <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff. I'm not... Yeah. And I turned up in like my my DC's baggy jeans, a fucking hockey shirt with corn on it and stuff like that. And it was like, oh, what the fuck's that? You oh, must yeah. just you must have looked like you just walked out of banana arm at him. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> 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 pretty pretty much. And so, um you know, so I, I wasn't exactly a popular kid at school. Uh I was always the the weird kid. And shit, which was fine. I, I didn't mind that. I accepted it. I embraced it. You know, it was that whole thing that Kurt Cobain once said. I had that same attitude where it was, they laughed at me because I was different, but I laughed at them because they were all the same. Yeah. So it it didn't bother me, but I, I was just naturally drawn to that kind of thing. And I started learning about serial killers. And I didn't really know many people at the time who I could talk to about that stuff because even... My friends who were considered the weird kids as well, they were like, yeah, okay, you've crossed the line. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, we'll meet up at the weekends and we'll, 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 we'll watch horror movies and shit, but now you're crossing a line. I was like, okay, fair enough. Uh, so, like, I didn't really think about it too much. And then I, I met these people a few years back, a uh, lovely bunch of people, and we started talking about serial killers and it brought back all that knowledge. But yeah. it also forced me to kind of learn about other serial killers that I didn't know about and stuff. Because I was fascinated with the the psychology behind them. Like, what, what pushes someone to that point where they do these heinous things? Yeah. And the one that always stood out to me was Ed Gein. Now, in, in the history of comics, there's an era uh, where the outlaw comic was very popular. And outlaw comics were things like The Crow and Faust... And there was a guy called Hart D. Fisher who, shortly after Jeffrey Dahmer was arrested, he put out 
a comic called the uh, unofficial I think it was the unofficial biography of Jeffrey Dahmer and he also did like a couple of other Jeffrey Dahmer comics and trying to get them now, like, you know, you're going to have to spend a bit of money. And luckily, during the promotion for Ed Gein, Demon Hunter, I was actually on a show with RJ from Critical Blast and Hart D. Fisher. Well, so that was a really interesting time because when he put that book out, oh, my God, he was all over the place. He was on Jerry Springer. He was on Maury defending his right to free speech in order to put that book out because so many people took offense to it. And, you know, I thought about it and I thought, you know what? My, my friends here, they love serial killers. They'll watch comic book movies, but they won't read comics. You know, they, they might read a book. Some of them aren't really readers. Some of them were, but they weren't into comics and stuff. And I was like, but if I did a comic book that was a bit more in the fantastic kind of realm, but it featured a serial killer... I reckon they would read that. Well, and I, I got home from, from the pub one day after seeing them, and I just thought about it a bit more, and I was like, okay, you know, there's things like From Hell and books like that, but that's not going to be up there. It, you know, it does need a bit of that almost adventure kind of aspect to it, yeah. but still in the horror realm and stuff. And I sat there, and I started scratching my head, and I just couldn't think of anything. And I was like, oh, well, I'll come back to it later. And then I just met on my couch, t- turned on the TV. I can't even remember what the fuck I was watching. And for some reason, like, I'm just sat there watching TV and I'm starting to drift off to sleep. And then my brain just went, what about Ed Gein, Demon Hunter? And I just sat up and I started laughing because I was like, that's fucking ridiculous. That is a stupid and but, ridiculous idea. And it's just a title. It's just Ed Gein it. Demon Hunter. But it's just popped in, right? You, isn't it? It's just yeah. popped yeah. in. It. You don't know why. You don't know how. It's just gone yeah. bosh. For some reason, in that really relaxed state, my subconscious went, don't worry about it. You go to sleep. We've got a handle on this. Let's put <laughs> this word together and this word together and this name together. What about Ed Gein Demon Hunter? And I laughed because of how stupid it was. And well, that's what made me go, that's why I need to follow it, because it is stupid. But let's just see if it really is stupid. It seems stupid on the surface, but what's underneath it? That's what I'm always interested in. What's underneath it? And I started thinking about it, and I I didn't really know what to do with it, because, you know, I think a lot of people, if they'd had that same thought, they would have gone straight to, oh, so Bernice Warden and Mary Ho- Hogan, they were actually demons, and that's why he killed them. And I thought, no, 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 no. We're not going down there because that's too much of a basic idea and so disrespectful to the people that he killed. Like, whatever I do with this, I can't be disrespectful to the victims of his crimes. Yeah. And I started speaking to, like, a couple of people trying to just, like, you know, find people who might be interested in drawing it because I was like, okay, I'm not drawing it. (laughs) I don't think I'm the right person to draw this, whatever this idea is going to be. And, you know, I heard back from a couple of people who were like, yeah, no, I can't do it because my my schedule's busy or just simply I don't want the backlash from working on something like this. And I, you know, that gave me time to think about the story more. And then it just, it slowly fell into place of like, well, hold on, what if... What if it was after he died and so on? And it just moved from there. Like I was, every time I came up with just like the smallest element, I'd be like, no, that doesn't excite me. And then I'd think of something else. No, that doesn't excite me. And then I think of something else. And I, I always go back to it. There's a gut feeling and I can't explain what it feels like, but it gets you excited. Yeah. It gets you excited in a way where you're like, I can't actually stop thinking about it. Like, you could have had like five days with no sleep and you're desperate to go to sleep. You're tired as hell. But then that idea comes along that excites you so much. You're like, well, I'm not going to sleep tonight because I've got all this energy. Right there. Yeah. It and that's what I waited buzz. for. Yeah. It is a massive yeah. buzz. And I'm sure a lot of people will get that as well. Who are very. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you're if you're new to writing or you're thinking of it and you're watching these because you want to get into it, you wait for it. You'll get that buzz. It's going to be amazing. And once yeah. you get it, it sort of like overtakes you a bit. It's it's like you've got to yeah. get it down. You've got to get it down now. 
get it on there, get yeah. that word file open, bosh, 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 get something down before you forget it as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yard, especially when you're my age. <laughs> 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 the greatest side thing is you can't fucking remember what they are about a minute later I, it, it's so hard to describe that feeling but I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that that feeling is probably the most addictive feeling you can ever have and Ooh. it's what keeps you going as a writer it's why you don't get people or well I'm sure there are a couple of exceptions to the rule but most writers, they come up with that idea, write the book, and then they do another one. If they didn't like that feeling so much, they would just write one book and go, well, that's it. I'm going back to working at Sainsbury's. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah it's true. It's true. And I ne I've never written anything in, from when only a bits of silly poetry or, you know, silly messages in people's cards, birthday cards, and it's always do a little poem or something. But yeah. I'd never written anything till I wrote London Gothic. And once I started, I did not stop. It took, yeah. it doesn't take your life over. It just, it just gives you, push you in your own world. Yeah. That you, yeah, you enjoy, it you enjoy it. And whatever you're doing throughout the day, I mean, I, I, I run a company throughout the day anyway, but I'd be there and I'd be thinking, oh, written that. Now, what would happen if I changed that? And I'd done this instead of this and this is, so I'd write those bits down just quickly, and um, yeah, and then go. And when I got home, I'd look at the the, the script that I'd done, and I'd go, "Nah, doesn't work." Or yeah, and let's change that, and then bosh you on it again. And like you say, you could be there for hours. You don't even see the time go. Yeah, see yeah. the time. Oh, absolutely. It just it just it just goes, and before you know it, you start at five. It's half past twelve at night, and you've done about twenty thirty pages. Yeah. And, and you read back through them and you think, wow, did I actually do that? <laughs> so, that yeah. that it, is the best. It gives you a buzz because you just end up in a funny little world. And I always say with London, mm -hmm. the devil made me do it because I can never remember writing it. But I think what you're it, saying, it, it does, it just it, kicks. I I was talking to someone a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine. Um, you Actually, you, you know him as well, Marshall. Yeah. And I was saying to him that sometimes when you're writing a story, from from the moment that idea comes along, that you're like, oh, I want to write this story, that really excites me and stuff. And it and it, it's got a hold of you so much, you have to write it. You don't even worry about yeah. the development. You're like, you're like, fuck it, I'm just putting something on the paper now. Even if I have to do like 10 drafts to make it good, I just need to put something on there now. I said to him, like, the only thing I can equate it to, and I'm sure it is not this, but it fucking feels like it, is that somehow you've managed to get your brain on a frequency where you've tapped into an alternative dimension. Yes. And all, and all you're doing is you're watching someone else's life play out and you're writing it down as a story. They're dictating it to you. They're saying, oh, no, 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 at that bit, that didn't happen. When I was out the other day and I was kicking someone's ass, that, that's not what I said for them. It was more like this. And then this happened and stuff. You really do feel like you're possessed. Yeah, it, and it's true. That's that's how it felt to me. It felt like it wasn't me who did it. Huh. I don't know how. I still, I, I've never lied to people. I just don't know how I did it. I mean, I can write stuff now because I've done London yeah. and I am writing bits and pieces and I've written other po poetry, like horror poems that have been published and stuff like that. But, but yeah, I just don't, I just still, it just kickstarted me onto that. So if people are getting new to it, then go for it and, and you will experience sure. that feeling of, of yeah, whatever it is, supernatural for all we know, I don't know, spooky yeah. possums. <laughs> I mean, I, we, we both gravitate towards the horror genre anyway. I think that's because of our tastes, but I would also assume because of life experiences as well. Yeah. So I, I, I do, I do think for other people they may experience it, but it may not make them gravitate towards the horror genre straight away. But then again, you know, you could have that idea. That makes you go, oh my god! I've got to write this book. I've got to write this story. This story is so fun. This is such a good idea, and it's in the horror genre. And then the next idea you have, you end up going, this is a romance, or this yeah. is a comedy. 
yeah. kind of thing. And that and that's okay too. Yeah, definitely. I'm 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 currently at the moment, funny enough, because I don't get the time to write anymore. And and huh. I do miss the buzz. But I did get it back uh funny enough this week. Uh, I I've had a conversation with a friend of mine, a really good friend, who wrote as a as a hobby, he was writing um plays. <clears throat> and um yeah. I, I don't yeah. think he ever had any pull on the stage, but he used to really enjoy doing them and he's mad on London Gothic, absolutely loves it. And yeah. uh, he said to me uh, about, he's always questioning me about London Gothic and, and how I did it. And he still doesn't believe that I did it. Like most people, I go, no, Nick never done really? that. He's thick. How does he do yeah. that? <laughs> 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 yeah. But um, I said to him, I said, well, would it be good? I, I get so much, I get so many ideas. Um, yeah. And I write little syn- synopsises down of these ideas of different ones would be good if I had someone to actually write them, come on board with me and be a co-writer to actually physically write them and then work on it together. And he's retired. So he said to me, I'd love to do that. Absolutely love it. So uh, we're going to be working on something, a new idea, which is is, is horror-based. So hopefully we'll get that, that out there. And I'm enjoying, I got a buzz because... When he started telling me, he, he sent me an email with a, what he thought. I just gave him an idea in his head. I went, look, this is the idea. It's this character, and he does this, and he does that, and that's where we're going with it. And he went away, and he wrote like a about four pages. He went, oh, I really enjoyed that. I got a buzz out of that. And it's exactly the buzz. Yeah. I wrote it and got a buzz because I'm adding bits to it. And that's what it yeah. is. It, and, and all of a sudden I thought, oh, wow, this is how I felt when I done London Coffee. That's why I described it earlier as when, when you're doing it full time and it's your career, it's your job. That's why I described it as having a play date with your imagination every day. Right. Because you don't have action figures. You have the characters in your mind. Those are the action figures. And you literally have to try and get yourself into that state of mind you had when you were a kid but with the knowledge that you have now. When you were a kid, you'd grab any old action figure because no one was telling you, like, "Ah, you can't do that, you've got to follow these rules. There were were no rules. Your Thundercats could play with G.I. Joe and the Turtles at the same time, and you would come up with these big, epic tales that they made no sense. But now, as being older and having characters in my mind to be my, my action figures... And knowing what I know now, you see, like, it, it's such a surreal thing <laughs> to, yeah, to explain. It is. But, but it is that same thing. You are getting those action figures and doing stuff, but you're just remembering, like, oh, no, there is, like, a structure. There is a boundary. This is too far. This isn't far enough kind of thing. And, that, and like, that, that is part of the job. Definitely. Daydreaming. Yeah. Daydreaming and going, ah, oh, well, what if this happened? Bro. Like, you, that's the thing about idea generation. Like, I mean, I've mentioned sort of like things like my dad having a battle with cancer being an inspiration uh, for a story. I've talked about with Ed Gein how it was wanting to make something that I thought my friends who don't read comics, they would read this and they would really fucking like it. Uh, yeah. with Lady Satan that's on the way now, that was just going through a really shitty experience in life, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. But you can e- you can easily have an idea for a story just because you're having a laugh and a joke with someone and they'll say something. They'll say, yeah. they'll say like a phrase that they say all the time and that do, that will just get you thinking. You could be walking down the road and see like a pigeon with one leg doing something weird and that will give you an idea for a story because i think the most common question that the people ask and this is what i was uh, referring to earlier when i said there's two that i always get asked this is the second one that is like how do you come up with an idea how do you find an idea and i'm like no 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 that's the thing don't look for the idea allow everything around you to inspire you to have ideas yes start questioning things when you see a piece of graffiti on a wall ask yourself why did that person 
have to do that. What yeah. are they trying to tell us? Create a story from that. Have fun with figuring out something that you really don't need the answer to. <laughs> you know? And if you have that small idea, the idea will find you. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, will, it, will, it will expand and you, you'll think to yourself, you're, you're thinking a bit, but yeah. how did you think of that? How did you make Bob the Matchstick Man into a superhero? But how? Yeah. What made you think of that? It just, it yeah. just seemed that like, it, it really is a strange phenomenon. Yes. <laughs> Ah. Yeah, it, it okay. really is. I yeah. mean, I remember watching an interview with uh, the film director, David Lynch, in heaven, everything is fine. Oh, Love that movie. Um, but he, he was saying that he actually feels that idea generation is more like fishing. Oh. You, you have to kind of sit on the edge of a boat with a fishing rod. And, you know, you, you put the rod in and you start hooking out ideas and you throw yeah. some back and other ones you keep. And yeah. I think that's that's really a really interesting perspective on it all. Definitely. No, that's a good way of putting it. That's a good way of putting it. And then because <laughs> sorry, mate. No, 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 you carry on. I forgot what I was gonna say now. I told you I'm getting ill. You found me with a fishing. I actually thought for a minute there, fucking I've been fishing for ages. <laughs> <laughs> And all of a sudden, the episode's about fishing. Yeah. Just like that. Of course. Well, I, I, I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that I'm not the only one that gets asked questions. You're not the only one that gets asked questions. Lots of people get uh, get asked yeah. questions about idea generation. Um, but I actually have three questions in front of me right now. And these are questions that I've been asked. But they're questions you've been asked as well. So I thought we should like work through them. And the first one is where do you where do you get your ideas for characters from? Because that is different to ideas for a story. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And you have to have both. Personally, my ideas, like I say, they just pop in there sometimes. And uh, I just don't know how they pop in. It, it could be something that I've seen on the telly or read or or whatever, that is stuck in that part of your brain yeah. and it works its way round. And then when you are at that stage where you think, oh, I'm ready for a story, <laughs> the gremlins <laughs> go, well, how about this one then? But they pop it in there. And, it's, and, and yeah. with me, quite a lot of it is characters. I, I tend to yeah. have characters before I have a story. I build a story around no. it. I think you've got to have it. You gotta have a character that either people love or fucking hate. Not hate, yeah. Fucking hate. Because yeah. Yeah. That will build your story. You can build a hero in on someone that they hate. Yeah. You can build a, someone in a villain to someone that they love. You know. So you've, you you build everything. I, I personally, talking from my my experience, I build everything around the characters. When my characters. A lot of London Goffey, if I, I speak for that, they, they've been with me since I was a kid. I used to make them up in my head. They started with, yeah. uh, I used to have the Sandman, as I called him, who was like um, in rags and used to crawl around the yeah. top of houses and stuff like that. And I used to scare the shit out of my mates when we was in feral. <laughs> the, we would go out at night, all hours of the night, and, and there would be old derelict buildings or buildings being knocked down. And I'd throw stones up where to, to where they, they wouldn't half knock this building down. And I'd go, look, Sandman's up there. And they would see it because <laughs> I've said it. So I've got yeah. it straight away, you know. And and that, that sort of built me for telling stories because I'd, I'd, I would be walking all around London and I'd just tell them stories. And we'd go down the old cobbly streets and I'd go, oh, I'd jack the ripper lift. Who the fucking hell knows if Jack the Ripper lived there? I'm just telling them a load of bollocks, really. But I'm making up yeah. a story. And and they would say, oh, did yeah. he really? Yeah, of course he did, yeah. Yeah, and that's where he killed someone there. And that's where, he, I don't know, I, you know, total crap. But he, they believed it. And they would be engrossed. And because I had them, I suppose that's where my storytelling came from. 
and then I would build these characters. Yeah. Didn't I've always had, I've always loved a, a Victorian period. Um, yeah, and back in, I don't like nowadays or future. It's not my thing. Some people's they can make fantastic characters or stories up future or now at the present. Yeah, but it's not my thing. I always like to go back, and then I like to research different people yeah. or, or settings or places that actually existed. Um, yeah, and then bring those people in. As characters, a bit, a bit like yourself, really. Right. With with talking yeah. about a geek, um, really? I know you branch off on a lot of different areas with Lady Satan as well. Um, but yeah. well, with your Ed Gein, it's the same thing. It's a historical figure that you've uh, yeah. You've made well, your own. I mean, uh, I mean, one of the appealing things about the the actual concept for Ed Gein was being able to do it after he died but still in the but still in the past for me and mm. there, there was something about that that just really sang to me and with with lady satan when the book opens up it, it opens up in new year's eve 1993 i think it is and then it jumps forward to new year's eve 1999 yeah. So there's still a part of it that's set in the past. Where when I first started working on on writing professionally, uh, rather than just as a hobby, a lot of my stories were they've got to take place in the now. And after a while, I'd be like, "But I've got all these ideas, and I'm not going to be able to tell all of them before I die. But I want them to take place now. But by the time I get to it, it will be ten years in the future. Will that story?" still be the same and i just got to this point where i was like i am much more interested in telling it in the recent part or or a bit further sometimes i mean yeah. i've been bouncing around with an idea for a possible uh book to work on after lady satan yeah that uh, that definitely. will t that will take place in two different timelines and one will be like one timeline would be the 80s and the other timeline would be the second world war well because i just think there's something I don't, I, especially with where we are now uh, in the world and all that, like we, we've progressed so far in such a short amount of time. And, you know, we've seen firsthand like the rise of politics becoming very popular, which I think is one of the most awful things that ever fucking yeah. happened. Like it's just bullshit. As, as someone said to me, politics is for puppets. And right. I completely agree with that statement. Um, you know, and we've seen the rise of technology and everything. And to me, that that doesn't inspire me to create stories. No. Uh, what inspires me to create stories is looking back that little bit. So, yeah, I, I, I'm with you, man. I, I'm very similar, in, especially yeah. now. I'm more interested in telling stories uh, in years gone by and being able to do that research. That is such a huge, huge part of the process that is so fucking fun yeah and and you only have to start off with one character yeah it, it, it is it's yeah. one character it took me 40 years to to write london gothic to actually put pen to paper so to speak and yeah. i started off with who i called the sandman now he's called the soul creeper for legal reasons but yeah um he needed he was a villain so i needed a hero so then yeah. you create a hero. That's where it gets creative because you have to look yeah. at things and go, right, I'd love him to be like this. The first time the Duke was ever drawn in 19... Mm -hmm. Oh, it might have been... No, 2015, when I first had the thought of, of actually getting this thing down, was uh, <clears throat> it was a guy at work... It was, a, it, was a, it was actually a talented artist who works for me. Yeah. I, I said to him, I'd love to, to get a picture of the Duke. And I explained to him what Hello. he did. Well, when he drew it, he actually looked like V for Vendetta. Oh, right. So my subconscious was saying, yeah, and I want him to have this, and I want him to have a little funny moustache and a little bit here, and he's got to have, you know, like a bowler hat or a top hat and, you know, have a... <laughs> big leather jacket with all knives in it. And, and I'm thinking, when he done it, I went, that looks really good. And then after a while, oh, fuck me, it just looks like FIFA Vendetta. 
<laughs> so I thought, well, 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 I can't do that. So years passed and I still didn't get around to write. But then when yeah. I got to it, it gave me a base. And I went, right, that's what the Duke I thought of when the guy yeah. drew it. How can I make him different? So I did. I changed him around and, and researched of what sort of weapons people had in, in that era and things like that. So, yeah, that, that, that's how it came to that. And Jellico, I thought he's got to have a sidekick. Well, my granddad and my uncle in, uh, in Ireland, just a pair of nutters. Yeah. And, and that was it. He, he, just, he was created as those people. Yeah. And he's the one most people love because he's cheeky and he's piss taker and, you know, he's sarcasm. And he's just a loom. But he he wasn't even mentioned before. So it's amazing how things develop and you'll bring these other characters in that you need to to make that story. Yeah, yeah I, I do think that a lot of ideas for story come from characters. Like concept you can come up with before you've even got a character. That's easy. That's no problem. Because that's a, once again, that's another part of idea generation is sitting there and saying, what if? What if this happened instead of this happened? Or or what if someone realized this X, Y, Z kind of thing? But the story itself doesn't form beyond the concept and the premise until you really have a, just a tiny little spark of a character. That, I mean, think yeah. about it. How, how many fairy tales begin with once upon a time, there was a princess. Yeah. Or once upon a time, there was an evil king. They, they, the first thing they mention in that story is there was a person. This is what the person was like. This is what they did. This was their attitude. This was their perspective. Because characters are kind of the heart and soul of the story. You, if you find a story and you take every character out of every scene, you've just got shots of really nice locations. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. It's yeah. not a story. The no. characters help make the story so, make it, so it, it is important to spend time thinking about them and it, you, if you've got a character or characters and you've got that story in your head that you develop yeah. you can take those characters and put them anywhere within that story that you want to yeah. they are yours you create them and you make your own world so yeah. you are the master of that world and it's no different to gameplay and um, not that I've played any, but I know a lot of people that play the Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like that. And, and no. you've got your character, and he goes into a world. The world's already been created for you. That that is, uh, you know, already there. So you've created his character, and you've made him, and and then he goes through, and he does what he does: fights or creates magic and stuff like that. And it's no different to write the story because it, it, you create that character, but you have to create that world that he lives in. It's got to be, yeah. go back, make it as original as you can. Now, with London Gothic, you, you've mentioned, obviously, like the main characters. But you do also use a couple of public domain characters in there. And that relates to the next question uh, that I know I've been asked, and I'm sure you've been asked as well. And that is, when you use, like, how do you use public domain characters because i think in a lot of people's minds it's if it's in the public domain you just take it do whatever the fuck you want with it um, it's not as clear cut as nah, that though nah. so like how how do you do it without breaking any laws because I, I think what a lot of people don't understand with copy with uh public domain characters is for example frankenstein's monster it's a public domain character you can tell a story with Frankenstein's monster in it. But you can't make him look like Boris Karloff in no. the Universal Monster movies because no. the look of the character is copyrighted by Universal. So if you make if you do a Frankenstein's monster story, you're okay. You make it look like Boris Karloff in those Universal Monster movies, you're going to get sued and you will lose. Yeah. So how did you handle incorporating Punch and Judy into London Gothic? Well, first of all, I did a lot of research to see where they'd been used, like visually. Yeah. And um, I know that uh, Neil, Neil Gaiman done a, 
a book about um, like a Victorian sort of thing about seaside Punch and Judy and everything else. He never created them as characters. He just mentioned them in his book. Um, and other than that, I think I think that, I'm not sure if Alan Moore had a Punch and Judy in the Extraordinary Gentleman. The I, I can't remember, but I remember researching it. But they were either Punch and Judy has been done in a lot of horror films. Yeah, so I researched those as well. And it definitely pays to do your research. If you get a public domain, yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to make it your own. So yes. when I researched back, I could not find a punch that had been a demon. Yeah. Now, definitely, for some reason, unknown reason, I couldn't find a punch who not only liked to entertain the children, but he also liked to eat them. Yeah. So I, I, I think there was a big trick that was missed there because... It is to me that that was a it was like finding a pot of gold. So yeah. thought, I've got to have him in it, you know, and, and he's one of the, the villains in there, and he has become one of the prominent, most hated villains. Good. So yeah, um we've got some other public domain figures coming into it in chapter two. Um yeah. and again I had to do the research for it. If you make them look Let's say we take, uh, I don't know, uh, Blackbeard the pirate. Yeah, yeah. Just have, and if you if you research Blackbeard the pirate and you see him in in any film or whatever, if it's like even a Monty Python one, I can't remember now, Yellow Beard, where he's got it on fire or Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh yeah, yeah. All his beards on yeah. fire and everything. If you copy that, then you could be liable to, to be you know, taking a call or get one of these official letters that they send out to frighten you. Um, yeah. If you make him different, if you made him a vampire with great big teeth, yeah. his beard wasn't on fire, yeah. that's fine. Because no one's made him yeah. a vampire. And so, you know, he, he might, that might have even given someone an idea. I might have to put that down. Hold on a minute. Oh, just get the old pen out. <laughs> Quick. Yeah, get it, get it, get it down. Get it down. Patent, copyright, TM, all that jazz. <laughs> all the vampires. <laughs> and yeah, so well, it, it's, it's trying to research as best you possibly can. Everyone makes a mistake. You, you might come yes. up and say, you might go, oh, shit, I've got a letter through an essay and it's very similar. These big corporations, yeah. you're not going to win. You can't fight them. You ain't got the money. Uh, I mean, let's put it this way. H.P. Lovecraft's stuff and Edgar Allan Poe's stuff is in public domain. Well, and because of that, so many people have gone, right, I'm going to I'm gonna do my own version of H.P. Lovecraft's uh, like From Beyond or, or whatever, right? And they don't realize only some of the H.P. Lovecraft stories in the public domain, not all of them. His well, estate still have some of them in copyright. I'm not sure if it's the same with Edgar Allan Poe. I haven't done enough research on that. But, you, you know, I, I don't think it is the same. I think with Edgar Allan Poe stuff, it's all in the public domain. Because well, I haven't heard of anyone having any copyright issues. And now the most, the most prominent one is, I think it was like at the end of last year or beginning of last year, Winnie the Pooh became oh, God, public yeah. domain. Yeah. So because of that, there's this mo there's this movie that's just come out called Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, which is yeah. a straight up gory slasher flick that I heard a review of it recently. It sounds it sounds like they had a good idea and fucked it <laughs> from word go. Which is um, I, I, a lot of films, yeah. Yeah, and I even found like the other wait, well, the other day, it was about a month or two ago, like I was just scrolling around. And I found out that there was someone doing a book called Winnie the Pooh Demon Hunter. No. And <laughs> what weirded me out about it was there were some similarities to Ed Gein Demon Hunter in there. And I thought, hey, hold on. I'm sure I'm sure they weren't pinching anything, but it was just one of those things where I was like, I cannot believe it. Of all the things you could have done with Winnie the Pooh, you decided to go for Demon Hunter. And there's there's some similarities there. Great. Um <laughs> But you know, I, I've I've had experience with with public domain stuff before. I was actually this is going back a few years now. Uh, a publisher got in touch with me because I was interested and I was planning to do stuff with a public domain character called Miss Mask, and I I had talked about it a little bit, 
but I didn't go into too much detail and I still won't because I might still do those story ideas. So I don't want to put them out there too soon. Mm. And uh, this publisher, they they actually got in touch and said, how about we start off by remastering the original artwork for the old stories? We'll get them out in a nice edition. Like you can help out with remastering the artwork and stuff. And then we can move on with new stories. And unfortunately, that that deal fell through. Uh, which is a shame, but that was kind of my first experience with a public domain character. And the second one, funnily enough, was a public domain character called Lady Satan. And what what had happened is, like like I said, I was going through a very shitty, dark time in my life, and I I was just looking around at public domain characters, and like I said, I found this one called Lady Satan, who, if I remember correctly, was created by George Tusker, who I think had a hand in creating Luke Cage for Marvel. And what what fascinated me with this character is they were they had been in like five or eight different strips, but they didn't know what to do with her because like the very first strip she was a spy fighting Nazis in the war. The next strip she was a witch fighting a werewolf. Each strip she was someone completely di- like they literally had a name and nothing else. And I sat there and went, okay, that's a blank canvas. You've just got a name. What do you do with that name? Yeah. And that, and that and that started me off going, what kind of person would call themselves Lady Satan? What have they been through to become someone who says, my name is Lady Satan? And I, I had a little bit of a thought about it, and I decided, well, if you're calling yourself Lady Satan, you're some sort of vigilante, you know, like almost like a Punisher-esque kind of vigilante, but probably a bit more disturbed than the Punisher. Well, so what did you go through that yeah. like made you that way? And I eventually got to the point where I thought, well, what if it was this 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 woman who had been abducted and forced to be in a snuff film, and she somehow survived the whole experience, and then it just snowballed from there. And before yeah. long, I I had this completely new character who the only thing she shares in common with the public domain character, Lady Satan is the name and the fact that part of her backstory is when she was a kid, she read those Lady Satan comics. So it's become my own thing. And shortly after I started promoting it, I actually had uh, Von Klaus, who's done a book called Monster MD and Terror in the Trenches. He got in touch with me and went, is your Lady Satan the public domain character by any chance? And I had okay. to explain for it. He went, and he just went, oh, thank Christ for that, because I'm doing a book with a character called Lady Satan who is the public domain character. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the other like risk that you've got to take if you're using a public domain character is you might not be the only one who's using them at that moment in time, and releases might clash. It might cause a bit of confusion in the marketplace. That is a risk you have to be very aware of. Definitely. If you're researching public domain, if you put in Google public domain uh, figures, you're going to get a list of the most popular. So if you, what I would say is, try to research characters from a certain era or, or genre that you're doing that were real or fictional. Yeah. Um, or legend, in my case. I like myths and legend. And then find out if they're public to me. Because otherwise you will end up crossing over. If you've got, like you say, Winnie the Pooh, the first thing that's going to come up on there on a top 10 is if you put public yeah. domain figures in Google, you're going to get Winnie the Pooh now, I would have thought. Yeah. So how many people are going to go, wow, Winnie the Pooh, we can do what we want with him, but there's going to be so many people yeah. around the world doing the same sort of idea. And then when you get your book out and you realise Winnie the Pooh, the vampire, is the same as someone who's done it in the States or in Australia yeah. or wherever, you're not original then. Yeah, absolutely. Because the unfortunate thing with, uh, with, with something like Winnie the Pooh entering the public domain is there are so many people out there, and I know I'm going to get some backlash for this, and I just don't care because it's called the truth. There are so many people out there who only create because they want to get rich quick. 
Yeah, so they see something like Winnie the Pooh come into the public domain and go, brilliant, we're going to make millions off of this because we're going to do something crazy with it or whatever. But there's so many of them, and they're all doing it at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And that is that is a bit of a problem. So you do have to be careful when you start playing around with public domain characters. It's actually better to play with the ones that no one's talking about yeah, because infinitely. You, you've got you've got all the room in the world to to yeah. really let your imagination come to fruition and do something spectacular and, with that. and that's the, otherwise you'll get lost in the fucking mist yeah it'll be a fad sorry it'll be a fad for a while so you'll have all yeah. this you need a poo and and they'll do it to death and then yeah. it'll it'll go away i mean i'm not saying any of it's bad i haven't seen any of the comics or the films or whatever but it, no. you just you just got so you're saturated with the same sort of thing and yeah it, and it's a bit like at the moment uh i'll, I'll watch the whole of the walking dead so i put myself through that and without no. slitting my wrists but <laughs> now i'm watching the last of us which yeah. I find personally is basically the same as The Walking Dead, but it's got people yeah. with cauliflower heads growing a fungus or whatever. So <laughs> it's the same concept and the same story of people trying to fight for survival. There's not a lot of difference there. It's got different characters. Yeah. Instead of zombies, you've got cauliflower heads, but it's, it's the same sort of process. And I think that with especially with all these big filmmakers and TV shows, and that, they are running out of original ideas. They just have not got original ideas. And you never know, you could come up with something and and, and then it gets picked up. It'll probably, probably take about 20, 30 years for it to get picked up, but it will get picked up and then they run with it. So you know, you just never know. But if well, you, I, think, I, I think that's... It's not. It uh, gets a bit samey, though. I think that's because at, at this moment in time, people who work at like the TV stations and uh, the, the movie studios, they are putting such huge amounts of money into those productions. It's too much of a risk. The average movie now costs around 200 to 250 million to make. Yeah. And in comparison to how much they used to make them for, being like 30, 40 million, it's too much of a gamble to try new stuff. So right. they like to stick with properties that have been done to death or concepts that have been done to death because they know that people will lay down their money for it. Like one of the easiest ways to make money, do a zombie story. But yeah. the problem you face there is because that thought's already been had, there's once again that oversaturation of zombie stories. So right. now you get a lot of studios going, nah, we won't do zombies. If you do something a bit different with it though, we might end up doing it Ooh, but it, yeah. you know that state of affairs means that you've got producers running it more than you have creatives and that that reminds me of i think it was oscar wilde who once said that when bankers get together they talk about art and when artists get together they talk about money yeah. you know um which yeah. there's so much truth to that i think but that's the thing when it's a creative endeavor and that much money is being spent on it, of course the money people are going to be the ones in control and deciding what does and doesn't go out there. But when the money that's put down for it is less and less, then the creative has more control. And that, I think that's why so many people are putting books out independently rather than going to traditional publishers. It's not because of the progression of how we distribute these materials. It is simply because you get the most creative freedom and the most chance to be original by doing yeah. something independently. Yeah. I mean, I, I've made, I've made no qualms about this. With Edgeen Demon Hunter, I took it to three publishers who all turned it down because they were like, no, we can't risk it because what if there's backlash? Yeah. What if there's this, that, and the other? So they turned it down. They, they all made it clear that they thought it was a great book. Mm. And if it had been a fictional serial killer, they would have taken it. But because it was about Edgeen, that was the big thing. And now we are in talks with a publisher on on possibly having it published through them, which is great. I don't know how that's going to turn out. I can't say any more 
than that. But, you know, that that's taken a long time to get to. And that's being lucky and just sitting down, doing the best job we could with the book and mm. getting the word out there. Yeah. Because that's, yeah. That, that's all you really remember. Yeah, I mean, I, I always, my, my view is that if you do something, do it for yourself and then hope yeah. that people like it. But talking about yeah, funny situation, absolutely. that's a whole new show. I mean... Oh, God, God yes. God, oh, yes. Bloody skin in me, isn't it? Well, there, there is one more right. question. There Ooh. is one more question uh, that I know I've been asked and you've been asked, and that's what's the best way to note down your ideas? Uh, well... I'm absolutely shit at it. I confess, I just, I'm just useless. So when when I I've got a great wife, that's all I can say. Who, who yeah. writes everything down, records it on her phone, and yeah. then if I need the idea, then I can play it back or read it and then write it as a, a quick synopsis. But I would yeah. say to anyone. When these things pop in your head, and I know I keep going on about it, but they will, and it'll be the worst times of day sometimes, you think, fucking hell. Yeah, you know. You're sitting on the toilet and you think, well, oh, Christ, I've just had another idea. <laughs> it's <laughs> all on the wall with shit. <laughs> <laughs> I've left me pen in the other room. But yeah, no. Um, oh, I'd say get yourself a little notebook, something. I've, I've always got some sort of little, weird little notebook here. And um, I've got a big journal that my wife got me. It's like a uh, like an occulty journal. And, yeah. uh, and I do write bits and pieces down. Uh, I also, if I'm at the computer and I have an idea, I try to stop what I'm doing and just quickly write on a word file. No matter what it is, yeah. just the idea. It doesn't have to be the whole story. I don't want to sit there and develop a story because I'm doing something else. I just get it down. Yeah. Ooh, I just thought on that. And then I've got different, I just label it and I put it in a folder and it just comes up as future ideas. Yeah. And that's it. And then I can go back there and I can, if, I, if I'm thinking, well, I'm going to do it, I need to do another story. I need to do another comic. I need to do whatever. I can go to that folder. Yeah. Like, what did I think of then? And out of all of those, that might align with my thinking on that day of what I want to do. See, for me, I get asked that question, and people really hate my answer because they ask me, "What? What do you do? Like, how do you take? How do you take note of your ideas?" And my answer is, I don't. I absolutely don't. I just don't write them down. I don't voice record them, whatever. My philosophy is, if I can go to bed and wake up and still remember that idea, and it's the first thing I think about when I wake up, that's the idea I need to follow. You know, yeah, uh, I've, I've always young. had it in that way. Give it 10 years, mate. Oh, you say I'm young. Give it 10 you years. You say I'm young. I'm a, f I'm a few millennia old now. Yeah. <laughs> you, give it 10 years, mate. You won't even remember that you need a piss. <laughs> uh, that sounds like me now to be honest with you like seriously if i if i need to go shopping i need to write shit down otherwise i will forget it. story ideas no because to There's me a story. the I that's a story lucifer goes <laughs> shopping <laughs> oh okay that's send your scripts into four chapters mate these adventures in tesco <laughs> <laughs> the wonderful world of Sainsbury's <laughs> now known as Satansbury's yeah. when he got lost in Argos <laughs> <laughs> oh, <excuse me. laughs> but, but this is the thing like I, I don't know what it is but I don't get me wrong there's been certain story ideas that I've had and they haven't survived the night whatsoever they, they've been forgotten but they're like, I don't worry about them. I don't sweat about them because the ones that really, that really stand out to me are the ones that I remember. There's no way that I couldn't forget them. Uh, like as, as strange as it, it may sound, I'm going to tell you another little story. So. Oh, about Sainsbury's. It was about. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. I'm saving that story for after I've hit stop on the record button. <laughs> if I could we'll find the Walker's crisps. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was um, it was last year. I was thinking to myself, sort of like you know, I, I'm I'm in my forties now, and there's everyone has that bucket list thing. I don't I don't do that. I don't subscribe to that idea whatsoever. But I was thinking, like, there's certain things in my life that people have opinions about, and they have strong opinions about them, and I don't because I haven't experienced them. And one of them was speed dating, right? I'd never experienced it. So, like, I'd hear some people being like, oh, that's for fucking moves, and other people going, oh, my God, I'd love to do it. I bet it's amazing. I thought, well, I can't join in with this conversation, right? And at the time, I just thought, fuck it, I'm up for a laugh. Because the worst thing that's going to happen is I get to weird out 10 strangers and I've got three minutes to do it in. Oh, sounds like a challenge to me. So I, I actually got tickets for speed dating, went on my Todd, knew fucking no one there, obviously. And I remember being sat there looking around like and everyone's getting ready. Like there's all these people who are nervous and I'm like, I don't care. I'm not here to score. I'm not here to impress any of these motherfuckers. I'm here to have a laugh, speak to strangers, and like I said, weird them out. Like, it's going to be fun. So I'm walking up to everyone before it's even started. You all right? How's it going? And you've got these name badges on you that say, hello, my name is Lucifer. So I had so many people going, is that really your name? Like, that's amazing. <laughs> right? And then I just had this moment where, like, you know, they rang the bell to go, could everyone sit down? You've got a number, sit down at this table, we'll tell you how it's going through. And they're explaining how it all works. And all I'm thinking is, oh, my God, how cool would it be if sort of like, you know, you've gone to a couple of tables, you've spoken to people, and then the lights go out, you hear a scream, the lights come back, and someone's dead in the corner because it's not really speed dating, it's a murder mystery night. I thought, like, that would be amazing. And I've never been able to forget that idea. Because there's but, something about that idea that makes you go, oh, I want to know more. I want to explore that idea. Yes, that yes, sounds good, mate. That sounds good. It's very mis yeah, I've, I've never... You've got to have a little bit, yes. old lady come in with a walking stick and she goes, I'm the detective, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, and then she pulls out a shotgun. Yeah, it's everyone else. Like, now you motherfucker. Yeah. Now tell me who he was. <laughs> it's everyone well, she pulled yeah. out. She wants you to take her. You... Oh, so... <laughs> <laughs> she pulls out a Ouija board. <laughs> but, but this is what I mean. Like, I never wrote that idea down because I know I'm never going to forget it. It no, was see... the same with Ed Gein Demon Hunter. Once I had the idea, I didn't need to write it down because it, it just stayed. Yeah. It was so, it just stood out to me so much and it, it said something to me. So I was like, yeah, cool. I'm going to have no problems remembering that one. We're, we're so different in that aspect. It's good because some people yeah. will like you and some people like me, they just can't remember. So if you don't get it down, for my case, it, it'll just get lost in the atmosphere and just float away somewhere out there. I but, mean, don't get me wrong. I, I don't recommend that anyone do it the way I do it. <laughs> you know? yeah, I don't know why I do it that way. It just does. Some people are like, yeah, they can just remember stuff. It's like, bosh. I mean, when I was younger, I could remember everything. It, it's yeah. just age. I just can't remember. Fuck all. I don't even know where I am now. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I don't even know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Someone told me I was going on the shopping channel. Well, you are. This is QVC. <laughs> Well, I'd like a nice... Now, pizza. what is it that you want to see? A heated slipper. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong code. No, I, I, think, I, I think you'll find that with any writer, whether they're a Stephen King or a Joe Bloggs, that they will all have a strong opinion on how to take down ideas. And yeah. half of those opinions will be like, don't do it. And the other half will be like, please trust me, do it. Because the amount of good ideas I had, wow. Yeah. And I do, ha I do have to state... <laughs> If you've been having a bit of the wacky backy, a bit of the old, ah, right, and you have an idea for a story, don't write that one down. <laughs> because in the moment, in the moment, you're going to think that story is fucking great. Sure. And then you're going to sober up and realise that you just wrote down the lyrics to the theme tune from Happy Days. That's all. See, see, I don't agree with that because not that I, I go on that stuff, but 
some of the no. best songs were written under the influence of drugs. So, I ah, but that's why, songs, that's not stories. Books, yeah, or stories or ideas could come from that. But it's, it, I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, owning your truck. If I go to I'm, I'm, his front, <laughs> <of them. laughs> you know, I've got a story, you know, look at this. Oh, no, man. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> like, I agree with you on the music things. It's like what Bill Hicks said. If, if you're against drugs, then burn every single one of your favorite albums. Yeah. Because I can almost guarantee the musicians that made them were high as kites when they did it. Oh. But for some reason, it's not the same as stories. And there are so many brilliant authors out there and comic book writers who have all said the same thing of like, yeah, you think you have an idea on drugs and for a story and it's great. It isn't, you yeah. know, they've all had that experience where they went, Oh, I thought that was a great way to generate ideas. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But we'll allow paracetamol. Yeah, of course. Of mm. course. And Absolutely. I think that one's that makes of painkiller. What, like Jack Daniel? Yeah, that always works. Fucking! <laughs> I met some of my greatest inspiration sitting on a, a night on the set here with a single malt after a battery of. <laughs> I've just had this great idea. My wife goes, "Shut up!" <laughs> <laughs> in the past, the when I've had that moment, yeah. <laughs> in the past, when I've had that moment, when it's been, you know, you've had a couple of drinks, and you go, "Oh my god, I've had a great idea," and then everyone goes, "What?" And I go, "I'm going to have another one." <laughs> That's what the great idea is. I'm going to have another drink. <laughs> All the crowd stop dead. Wait to hear what you're going to say. Like in a, what, <laughs> yeah, life, the, of, the, like the life of Brian. It's yeah. the life of Lucifer. <laughs> What's he going to say? As I've learned over the years, as I've learned over the years, that idea was never a good idea. And in the moment, it seemed like one. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I think it's I think it's about time that we we wrapped this one up because I think like we pretty much explored everything that we can do when it comes to the idea uh, to the topic of idea generation. So you know we we've covered where our ideas come from that that feeling that buzz that you get when you have a good idea the the fact that not all ideas are created equal but you know you should explore them a little bit as long as they aren't illegal <laughs> yeah. as i made clear at the beginning of the show yes but i think that is pretty much all that we can talk about this topic so i hope you guys who have been listening who have been watching have enjoyed this episode i hope this has helped you out i know i've had a lot of fun uh talking about this with you nick and i think you have had a always bit good. of fun too yeah always <laughs> good like always enjoy it <laughs> and, and but cat. before we go <laughs> oh yeah oh yes there's a reason why they paired us together <laughs> uh, but before before we go before we go nick do you want to tell them where where the people can find you where they can check out your work well we have got chapter two on kickstarter now so if you follow the link below uh you can sign up for that and that's uh, got a lot of rewards. If you haven't, if you haven't got chapter one, you can get that on there as well. But if you wanted just Fair. chapter one to try it, you can buy that on our website, which is uh, london-gothic.co.uk, um, and find us on Excellent. social medias. If you put London Gothic in, you'll find us somewhere snooping around. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. And of course, in the description, you will find a link to Nick's website and the Kickstarter campaign for London Gothic Chapter 2. You can find me on social media, but not so long. Not if I have anything to do with it. The best places to find me is at LuciferStorm.com. Please feel free to sign up to my mailing list because upon doing so, as, as a token of my appreciation to you and to show you that you really are that awesome, if you sign up to my mailing list, you will get issue one of Ed Gein Demon Hunter in a digital format for absolutely fuck all. It will cost you, <laughs> it won't even cost you your soul. That's how cheap it is. And I like souls. I like collecting souls, but not this time. And then not you can also one. find me on. <laughs> Sorry? Not <laughs> ask. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. Well, I'll stop. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why you should never sing the words "Save Our Souls." It, oh, it never sounds right. <laughs> uh, but you can also find me on YouTube. Just look for Lucifer Storm. I do the occasional video where I, I teach. Uh, a little bit on how to write a story and all that. So if you are a fellow storyteller and you want to learn more about the mechanics of storytelling, uh, you know, you might want to check out my channel. But Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure. Never a chore. As always. Mate. And I'm, sh I'm sure we will be back doing another episode soon. And you, that one person on Spotify who's following us, bless you, bless you and your cotton socks. <laughs> we will catch you again real soon. Until next time. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Most importantly, though, stay awesome. God bless you all.